ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take a look at the 144,000 who are sealed in Revelation chapter 7. According to the Bible, a seal is placed on their forehead. What is that seal? Gary Stimmel is here to discuss with me the mark of God. Thanks, J.R. You know, the, the 144,000 are somewhat mysterious. Uh, people have speculated about just exactly what it is they are doing. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 pictures four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. In other words, there's this immense calm that falls over the earth. And then verse 2 says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Now that's an interesting thought in itself. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now that is a that's a mystery. Let's face it, J.R. I've, I've read a lot of commentaries about these verses. In order to understand this, we need to get a grasp of ancient, the ancient use of symbols, seals, and marks. Tell us about it, Gary. Well, you know, uh, J.R., a seal, and, and by the way, if you uh, read archaeological publications, there are seals dug up in Israel, for example, by the thousands. Uh, there were signet rings, there were what's called cylinder seals, there were little uh, stamp-like affairs that would stamp the imprint of, usually of a nobleman, a king, uh, perhaps a property owner, or even a manufacturer. For example, uh, they used to manufacture pottery jugs, and the manufacturer would stamp his seal into uh, the wet clay before it's set up and before it was fired. <clears throat> and the seal in every case was to mark the property uh, or to ensure the authenticity of something or to put protection around it. For example, the king would seal up a door saying, let no man pass this door. This is under my protection. So the idea of protection, authenticity, uh, the idea of property uh, was expressed in the seal. We have all of that in the sealing of the 144,000. These people are sealed uh, as pro the property of the living God. They are sealed and verified or authenticated to do a particular work, and they are sealed to be put under the protection of their owner. Because, J.R., I think they need, uh, living in the tribulation as they do, they need all the protection they can get. In John chapter 6, we have a statement made by our Savior uh, concerning sealing. He says, for example, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son shall give unto him, for him hath God the Father sealed. Uh, this is the same thing he's referring to here. Jesus himself refers to the seal. Again, I think it's the same seal. The seal of the living God, in this case, used to seal the Son to guarantee provision for the believers. And then uh, the saint, subsequently, who is sealed, is assured that the Lord will unfailingly provide him with heavenly nourishment. This is the idea. The Father sealed me. The Holy Spirit seals you. Uh, Paul, in 2 Corinthians 1.22, uh, speaks of the Holy Spirit who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So we are actually marked, if you will, uh, with that I presume it's the same seal of the living God. Now this seal you're referring to by the Holy Spirit is not a visible seal. It does not appear on my forehead. At least nobody can see it. I can't see it. Right. That's I true. can't see one on your forehead. <laughs> I don't know, do you? whether it will be seen during the tribulation period? Will it be an identification mark that men can see? Well, J.R., this, uh, this seal it may well be visible. Now, we don't know. All, all I know is 
that there seems to be some precedent for a visible mark of some sort during the tribulation period. Now the use of a of an emblem or a logo, for example, yeah. may identify a company, but that logo is not the company. It's just simply the symbol mm -hmm. of what they believe. Absolutely. And so it is not the seal that saves us. No. But is the seal is a mark of identification of what we're all about, right? Yeah, and, and we, we of course have uh, a, an identification with the Father through Christ in the Spirit. And you know, J.R., it's my private belief, after having studied the idea of sealing, that that seal is literally visible to the angels, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's visible to God. I think he literally can see it, even though our eyes cannot make it out. This seal is used, it's like a logo, mm -hmm. this seal is used to tell the world what we're all about. But the seal itself is, it's like baptism. Baptism does not save a person, but it is the mark of identification of our salvation. Absolutely. And that appears to be what this seal is all about. Let's look at Ezekiel and an ancient mark that was placed on the saints. Well, J.R., this is most fascinating uh, because <clears throat> this is the one place in the Bible where we're actually able to see the sealing process. And we've, we come to Ezekiel chapter 9, and we have an amazing story. And I mean in every sense of the word. I do not exaggerate when I say amazing. Uh, Ezekiel saw six men come into the temple mount. Now, he, uh, he saw these six men. At the time, the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory, was departing from the temple because it was about to be put under the judgment of God. Ezekiel saw six men come through the northern gate, walk across the temple platform, and then come up through the inner gate, <clears throat> what's called the higher gate. And in fact, I'll read this. Ezekiel 9, 2 says, And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And by the way, the brazen altar is the altar of judgment. Uh, it's that brass judgment vessel. And, and he, this is very significant because Jerusalem is about to be judged. And the glory of the Lord uh, of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub where he was to the threshold of the house. The glory is about to depart uh, from the temple. Now, in, in this activity, we have a fascinating event. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations to be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, uh, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Well, it goes on from there, J.R. This is a horrible time for Israel. In fact, you might even say this is a miniature picture of the tribulation. Now, here are the saints who weep over Jerusalem, and God is going to spare them. He has a man with an inkhorn to put a mark on their foreheads so that when the destroyers come through, they will see who has the mark and will pass by them. It's kind of like the Passover, putting the blood on the doorposts and lintels mm -hmm. in the homes in Egypt of the believers so that the, when the Lord passed through with the judgment death of the firstborn, he would pass over that house and they would be spared. Same symbolism given here, isn't it? Exactly. Now, what is the mark? J.R., this is where it gets exciting because <clears throat> when we see uh, here in verse 4 and in verse 6 of Ezekiel 9, the mark referred to, it is in Hebrew, ha-tav. Ha-tav, which is ha being the, the definite article, the, and tav simply means what it says, tav, the letter tav, which is the 22nd final letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is the symbol of truth and perfection. 
And J.R., the mark that that scribe angel put upon their forehead, it was a tav. A tav. A tav. Incredible. This tav has a very special significance, a meaning. But how was it drawn? We, we know that it's in block style today. Mm -hmm. It looks kind of like a door with a little foot kicking out on one side, stepping out into the future. Mm -hmm. What was it in Ezekiel's day? Well, in Ezekiel's day, and we'll talk about this more in detail after the break, in Ezekiel's day it was shaped like a cross. And J.R., you and I know the importance of the cross. The mark was the symbol of the cross. It was the Tav in Ezekiel's day and the days uh, in uh, ancient times. Well, we'll talk about it more when we come back in just a moment. The Tav, 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet, stands for truth and perfection. In the days of David and in the days of Ezekiel, it was written as a cross. This is the mark God used in Ezekiel chapter 9 to place on the forehead of those who would be spared. Fascinating. It is fascinating. And you know, J.R., uh, in the early Hebrew, uh, the cross uh, was sometimes shaped as a plus. Sometimes it was turned slightly on its side as an X or a, close to an X. Sometimes, sometimes it actually looked like what we envision as the modern cross, that is, with a crossbar placed high on the vertical uh, element of the letter. So and it, not as wide as it was long. And not as wide as it was long. And it actually looked like a Christian cross. Now, to me, this is a prophecy. This is a very big prophecy of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You know, in Psalm 22, we have the statements of Jesus on the cross. Psalm 22 opens with, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. And it is the 22nd Psalm. Yes. Hence, the 22nd letter signifies this psalm. It is the psalm of the cross. That's right. So you see, these ancient uses actually were prophecies of the future when Jesus would hang upon the cross. And upon the cross, when Jesus was about to die, he gave the very meaning of the letter Tav. He said, yes. it is finished. Finished truth and perfection, established once for all time. That is exactly the meaning of the cross and of the Tav. You know, uh, speaking of the cross in Colossians 1.20, we have this, speaking of Jesus' work, having made peace through the blood of the cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. J.R., this says that the cross is a universal symbol of of finished work, truth and perfection, not only for things on earth, but also for things in heaven. In other words, that you, it's impossible to over-dramatize the meaning of the cross. And so down through the centuries, the sign of the cross has become the logo of Christians. Yes. Uh, the symbol of Christianity. It is a symbol to the world of what we believe and what we're all about. And it's fascinating to me that this was predicted in the pages of the Old Testament that it should be so. And so, uh, back in the days of Ezekiel, uh, when, it, when Jerusalem was about to be judged, the scribe angel inscribed the cross on the foreheads of those who were the elect in that day. J.R., I think it's not too much of, of a stretch to say that that same thing is going to happen to the 144,000. Passage in Ezekiel is a prophecy of the future 144,000. In fact, it's a future, a future, a prophecy of the future of Christians. And the prophecy is rich when you study it in depth because, and this is very important, the way you spell the letter Tav in the Hebrew is with a Tav and a Vav. You spell it with two letters. Tav, Vav spells Tav. Now, that is, let's say, the right way to spell it. You know, there's another place in Scripture where someone received a mark. And yes. that happens to be in Genesis 4.15. The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, J.R. Cain was not known for his righteousness or his obedience. He, the mark of Cain. 
the mark of Cain. Wow. And we wonder what it is. But if you look at the Hebrew text, you discover that instead of being spelled Tav, you take the two letters and reverse them, put the Vav first, and it's pronounced Ot. And it means a mark or sign. It's the exact reverse spelling of the mark that was put upon the saints of God. In other words, one mark is a cross. So what would the other mark be? A broken cross? A broken cross. Fascinating. <laughs> and and that's one of the most ancient symbols in history. As a matter of fact, Manley Hall, uh, who is an authority on the occult and an occultist figure, calls the broken cross the most nearly universal of all religious symbols. Uh, you know, it's fascinating because uh, that cross came to be uh, infamous during the days of Hitler. It was called the swastika. And uh, if you look in an encyclopedia, you discover something interesting about the swastika. I'm quoting from the Encyclopedia Americana. It's a symbol of the sun in the nature religions of the Aryan races from Scandinavia, Scandinavia to Persia to India. Uh, and similar devices occur in the monumental uh, remains of the Mexicans and Peruvians and on objects exhumed from prehistoric burial mounds within the limits of the United States. The swastika consists of a Greek cross, which is a, the letter key, either enclosed in a circle or <clears throat> the circum their circumference of which passes through its extremities. So we're talking about here a cross with a circle around it. Or if you just eradicate parts of the circle, you end up with a cross with its arms bent back. In the ancient uh, Buddhist religion, I think it was referred to as a sun wheel or sun wheel. Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. of the ancient past. Absolutely. The sun wheel, symbol of the sun god. It is a, a idolatry to the extreme, isn't it? And it is the mark of Aryan superiority. Now, we all know that Hitler took Aryanism to the extreme. He adopted this symbol. He placed it on an orange background on uh, uh, the flag of the Nazis. And in so doing, he announced to the world, I am going to take up the banner of something that failed thousands of years ago. As a matter of fact, the planners of, of Nazism, JR, were students of ancient history. And they felt that, that in order to recover the lost world, someone with the power of the ancients needed to rise up, recapture it, and found a new kingdom. So you're saying that, that um Adolf Hitler revived the mark of Cain. That's exactly what it appears to me. Incredible. Is this a fulfillment of prophecy, Gary? J.R., it is a fulfillment of prophecy because we know in prophecy that there would be a number of kings in succession who would rule over the world. In fact, seven kings followed by the eighth king. And, and J.R., I believe this goes all the way back to Cain, now that we think about it. So Hitler in uh, Revelation is, uh, seems to be referred to as the, the one who rises up and only lasts a short time. Right. A little season. A little season. <laughs> and then after him comes the eighth king, the Antichrist. Now there's coming a mark of the beast. Um, it is the mark or the name or the number of the beast, 666 being the number of the beast. Um, is it possible that the German swastika was the precursor to this future world mark? I believe so, because it's the bent cross. Again, the true cross is, is spelled Tav, Tav Vav. The false cross is spelled backwards, uh, Vav Tav, pronounced Ot. And JR, to me, it could be nothing more than or less than the bent cross. Uh, a couple of authors after World War II uh, in France wrote a documentary of Nazism. Their names were Pavels and Bergier. They wrote a book called The Morning of the Magicians, documenting how the planners of Nazism really were attempting to resurrect what they called the ancient Thule society or uh, the ancient world. And they actually said that once there was a great body of men who lived before a cataclysm. And they were all killed at this cataclysm. 
but we are going to resurrect their spirits and bring, uh, bring them back under the sign of the broken cross. And J.R., I wish I had time to go into the details, but it, it suffice it to say that the cross is the sign of Aryan superiority, meaning the superiority of the ancient world of the occult. Is it possible that the mark of the beast will be another variation of this same cross? Back in the 60s with the peace movement, the peace symbol was an upside down broken cross. Right. Another variation of this same thing. It had the circle. That's right. It had the cross mm -hmm. in the circle. Yeah. Just as you see, and by the way, we have uh, several fonts in our uh, library of fonts for our computers. Nowhere can we find a swastika. It's, it's just not politically correct anymore. It's been purged. But we do have the peace symbol and the other uh, symbols. It's, it's amazing, Gary, that, hmm. that this mark of Cain is rising once again. And J.R., the good news is that you and I have the seal of the cross upon us. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Fascinating. Are you sealed? We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> 